morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, October 17th, 2023. The time is 5.45 p.m. I'd like to call to order the City Council and the City as Successor Agency to the Emeryville Redevelopment Agency and the Management of Emeryville Services Authority. This meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format. Members of the public who wish to participate in this meeting can join us at 1333 uh, Park Avenue in City of Emeryville at City Hall, or you may join us using the Zoom link provided for in today's agenda. Public comment will be received both in person as well as online. This time I'll ask if the clerk would take the roll. Councilmember Carr? Present. Councilmember Mora? Present. Councilmember Pryforce? Here. Vice Mayor Welch? Here. And Mayor Bowders? Here. Members, are there any of you who wish to report an ex parte communication for an item on this agenda. Okay, seeing and hearing none, now is the time for public comment. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment for any item on the closed session agenda or items not on this agenda? April, do we have any hands raised online? No, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Public comment is now closed. And Madam Clerk, the time is 546. We will adjourn to the closed session to deal with items 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and their subparts, and we'll report out upon conclusion.
Article 657, we've returned from closed session. I would like to invite City Attorney John Kennedy to report out of closed session. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Botters. There were no act reportable actions taken in closed session today. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Clerk, the time is 657. This meeting is adjourned. And I'll call now to order the special study session. Madam Clerk, the time is 6.57. I'd like to call to order the City of Emeryville's special study session for the evening. This meeting is being conducted in a hybrid format. Members of the public who wish to participate can join us here at Emeryville City Hall or by joining us via the Zoom link provided for in today's agenda. This time, Madam Clerk, would you take the roll? Councilmember Carr? Present. Councilmember Mora? Present. Councilmember Pryforce is absent. Vice Mayor Welch? Here. And Mayor Bowders? Here. This time I'll entertain a motion to approve this agenda. I move approval of the final agenda. Second. Thank you. There's a motion by Welch and a second by Carr to approve agenda. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr? Aye. Councilmember Mora? Aye. Councilmember Pryforce is absent. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. Ex parte communication. Is there any members reporting an ex parte communication for this agenda? I have a couple. I have uh, met with members of the Sierra Club. I've met with Biocom California, and I have met with uh, various animal rights activists and um, environmental justice groups on regarding the study session. Now is the time for public comment for items not on the agenda. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment for an item not on this agenda? I see no hands raised online and nobody present here. So public comment is now closed. They'll bring us to item six, which is our study session, 6.1, protecting pollinators. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, this evening, uh, we're bringing before you a discussion for a potential ordinance to protect pollinators and the food web. Um, Is the microphone on? Hello? You can hear him, okay. Drew says he can hear you, okay, go ahead. Uh, on June 20th, um, Mayor Bowder uh, proposed this as an agenda item and was supported by the Council to discuss uh, the ban on neonicotinoids, a ban on rodenticides, uh, amend the municipal code nuisance ordinance related to lawn maintenance for placement of wildflowers in lieu of, of lawn and to create a voluntary wildflower, wildflower program. Um, this was also proposed during the National Pollinator Week in an effort to take action locally to protect pollinators and the food web. So next page. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so to talk about um, neonicotinoids, uh, what are they? Uh, they're definitely a pesticides that are intended to kill insects, uh, though some studies have shown or been found to negatively affect uh, many non-target insects such as bumblebees and honeybees. Um, sorry, uh, neonicotinoids impact on targeted insects and non-targeted pollinators such as native bees uh, are known. Uh, emerging studies and actions and other jurisdictions suggest that neonicotinoids may also affect soil quality, water quality, birds, mammals, and humans. Given that, uh, and, and given that effective non-environmental or environmental friendly alternative treatments are available, it's recommended that the use of neonicotinoids be prohibited uh, within the city of Emeryville. Next page. So in Emeryville, the use is neither city staff or contractors use neonicotinoids. Um, there is concerns that with there's straight preemptions that there's risk on city bans of sales transportation or use broadly uh, would not be allowed. Uh, but the city could look into um, a ban use on city owned and leased properties. Um, there was one correction we did want to make at the time we wrote the staff report. It was believed Safe Harbor, who manages the marina, was using neonicotinoids, but we have confirmed that they do not. So we wanted to make sure we cleared up that. Um, so to reiterate, there is no use of neonicotinoids in public buildings, public property, or public parks. Next page. All right. 
So similar, so now we're going to talk about rodenticides, which are pesticides that kill rodents, including mice and rats. Um, there is potential secondary poisonings caused by other animals eating poison prey. Um, but like neonicotinoids, it appears that the state law has preempted the ability for everybody to ban or regulate rodenticides by enacting restrictions on their sales and use and transportation. Um, next page. So looking into the use of uh, rodenticide, uh, the city contract with pest controls does not use rodenticides. Our landscaper uh, currently does use it when needed to address uh, issues in parks and open spaces. Um, what else was there? Um, the city could also consider here uh, to, to uh, do a ban uh, on use on city owned properties or lease properties to consider. Uh, next page. Rodenticide alternatives. So because of burrowing holes in parks that can create a trip hazard and uh, trip and fall hazard, um, one of the alternatives could be to, um, to rodenticide is to trap. Um, one of the concerns we have is that, you know, when you do trap, often the rodents are left there for hours before retrieval. Um, and, but our current contractor um, does, has concerns with doing that and will not do it because of safety concerns with potential uh, for people to be hurt uh, because of the traps that are put into the holes. So. Uh, next page, please. So one of the other ones is to look into amending the municipal code for the placement of wildflowers. Uh, there seems no, to be no concerns into to considering an ordinance or to uh, a grass planting ban. Um, this could be a voluntary and could be managed and advertised by city departments or potentially another entity. Um, the Emeryville Municipal Code maintenance provisions sets for property because are considered as a nuisance, but staff anticipates that any wildflower incentive ordinance would not involve changes to these uh, provisions and could instead include its own recommendation for maintenance that would be consistent with the rest of the municipal code. The wildflower incentive ordinance would govern the city's donation of seeds and potentially other assistance that the city may provide to assist property owners in a wildflower, with wildflower planting. Uh, next slide, please. So we could create a wildflower program that the city could subsidize. Cost for about 25 pounds of wildflower seeds uh, could be about $900, which would cover 25,000 to 50,000 square foot. Um, <clears throat> um, the program would promote planting wildflowers uh, that could provide bay friendly wildflower seeds to homeowners who would remove grass or fill their yards with something that promotes bee and butterfly habitats. So that brings us to our last slide, which is questions. Be happy to answer. We have staff here that could answer specific questions that you may have. Okay, before we take public comment, are there any questions that members have for the staff? Member Mora. Uh, you mentioned the rodenticide is used in parks and open spaces. How broad is that, or is that just a very specific location? It's specific to when having uh, rodent issues in the park, uh, and in the last few years, the only park we've had issues uh, has been Christie Park for the holes that have been created in the lawn areas, and so they have used it in that location. There hasn't been any other locations that we're aware of at this time. Member Pride Force. I'm not in where the uh, community garden is because I, whenever I cross there, there's always rats that are, like tend to pop up. But there's no hasn't been complaints or there hasn't been any complaints okay. or hasn't been addressed by our landscaping company okay. to for that. Gotcha. Wh which okay. community garden are you referring to? Uh, the community garden uh, near uh, gosh, you, we, uh, yeah, when you go through that sort of like the little cul-de-sac, and because uh, I bike through there. Um, on Doyle? Yeah, I, I, no, 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 it's past Doyle. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I can Google find out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, are you referring to an organic garden, like one of the city's organic gardens? Yes, yeah, the one where there's. Um, yeah, there's usually people working there in the. That's the Doyle Street one, probably. Oh, that's, okay, so that's Doyle. Doyle and 15th. Yeah. Okay. And there's there's three. There's one all the way down at the South Triangle at okay. 36. Yeah. That's not what you're referring to. No. That's, yeah. Yeah. There's like the if, one all the way out by Temescal Creek Park. Yes. If it, it's like a it's a direct line to the Amtrak. Like if you were. To that's go to the, the Doyle. Yeah, okay. That's the Doyle. Okay. One. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're yeah, okay. So. But you're saying the only place that we've used it is Christie Park. Correct. That's the only place we've okay. had complaints to ask the landscapers to address that issue because it becomes a trip hazard having holes in the parks. Okay. Anyone else with questions before comment? Thank you. Oh, no, Councilmember Moore. Uh, I was also wondering if you could elaborate on the, uh, the alternative to the rodentist side in the staff report. It, it mentions that this is a labor intensive uh, alternative. Could you elaborate on that? Our understanding is for putting in a trap, um, they have to uh, put the trap into the ground um, and then have to check it every so often and, and then address it. And our scheduled maintenance for our landscapers is they're only here once a week. So that means they'd have to schedule more staff time and come back on a more reoccurring basis. Do you have any follow-up to that questions? No. Okay, okay. Councilmember Carr. Is this ordinance uh, going to be for city contractors only? Doesn't pertain to any private property owners? Uh, based on the way the uh, discussion can go, the, the council, um, because the state already preempts that you cannot ban, ban it, but you can look at, it, at city property or contracts and leases, and so um, we can implement it to those contracts, but not on private property. It would have to be only city property. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? We'll take public comment now. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, any member of the public who wishes to give comment on the study session item will have two minutes to give comment. Do we have any members of the public here wishing to comment on the um, biodiversity study session item? I see no hands raised online, so I'll close public comment and turn to discussion. I'm happy to kick it off if you all don't mind. Oh, member Moore. Did you want to go first? Uh, no, go ahead. Are you sure? You can go ahead. Um, I, I just uh, just some quick thoughts on the uh, redenticide. Uh, it seems like the you know, limited usage. It's uh, intended to stop people from tripping in these uh, holes, uh, but also I think the alternative of putting these traps that are checked infrequently at best uh, it seems almost inhumane. Uh, I think it's better for the um, gopher to consume the rodenticide underground and remain there uh, than to uh, get stay in this trap for who knows how long unless the city allocates more staff time to retrieving it um so it also seems unlikely to get into the uh the, the wider food stream if it's consumed by uh, some predator so i i based on the staff report uh, I, I don't support the ban of the rodenticide. Okay. All right, I'll give some comments. Uh, so I want to thank the council for agreeing to agenda this item, and I want to thank the staff uh, for their partnership and their time. I also want to thank the people in the community who do work around um, protecting and conserving our wildlife. Uh, so the reason I raised this during pollinator week uh, is because the globe is experiencing a crisis uh, related to pollinators and um, humans are the primary cause of it. It's climate change is human cause to begin with, but um, we're causing it in a number of ways and in urban communities it's playing out in several facets. One of them is um, the prevalence of neonicotinoids as, in a, as a chemical compound in pesticides. There's five of them and um, they're unfortunately becoming ubiquitous in, in, in the use of uh, pesticide products and they're, um, they adhere to plant life and they become attached to bees and other small insects that are then picked up and eaten by birds. Um, they poison the food web essentially and they're actually um, harming uh, the future production of uh, food and um, pollinated, pollinated growth. Um, in our communities. So um, despite the fact that we're um, preempted under state law from uh, banning them in private properties, um, what I'd like to recommend as one of uh, four recommendations tonight is I, I, I support um, that we ban them on city-owned properties, and I appreciate that Public Works is not using them now. 
um, that we ban them though on city owned properties and all properties that we lease as well as through our contractors that we do not allow contractors to use these products because they are literally poisoning um, the wildlife around us. Um, and as for properties where we already have existing leases that do not have this as a term, I'd like to further ask that we seek voluntary engagement for those properties to ask um, anybody currently in a lease on a city owned property to voluntarily agree to a lease amendment that simply um, agrees they will desist in using such products. Um, as to rodenticides, the problem with rodenticides is that uh, rodenticides uh, stay in the bodies of um, gophers, moles, rats, mice, and they're consumed by birds of prey who um, in turn uh, feed them to their young and then they kill um, typically raptors, birds. And so uh, I understand from the staff report that we have uh, a, a need and a use for them um, currently at one park in particular and that when they're consumed, they um, typically are eaten by vermin that are underground. Um, and so they're not actually above ground where they can be consumed by uh, larger, larger uh, rats. So I would be supportive of um, limiting the ban of rodenticides to um, public parks um, so that it's only used for that limited purpose, uh, but that banning it on other properties like City Hall, other things, are places where there can be traps as alternatives, I would I would recommend that. And then the wildflowering program, uh, it's very it's very cost effective for us to um, to replace uh, grass, which is water consuming, um, which doesn't provide any actual oxygenation to the air. It's very little environmental benefit that's created by grass. And I think that we should do two things on that. One is that I think we should ban grass in future residential properties uh, so that product projects going forward in the future don't actually increase the consumption of water, but instead um, provide wildflowering habitat for birds, bees, and butterflies, which are pollinators. Um, and I think we should have a voluntary wildflowering program that uh, allows us to support residents who want to convert their water consuming yard um, voluntarily into a place where they can have a bee and butterfly habitat, um, which helps bring biodiversity into our community. And I would uh, just ask that the nuisance ordinance be amended only insofar as to say, notwithstanding the voluntary wildflowering program and then leave the rest of the ordinance in place. So it's clear that the wildflowers are not a nuisance in the city because under the current reading of it, things with blowing seeds would need to be cut down weekly by a homeowner. So those are my suggestions and recommendations. Um, and I'd be curious to hear people's thoughts. Member Pry for us. Uh, question, um, I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't own a pet. Um, at the courtyards uh, at 65th where I reside, there is a dog park, uh, it's actually not far from me, that uses grass. So in the future, does the does wildflowers, uh, can they replace grass uh, in terms of uh, being used for dog parks? No, so for a dog park, it would be, they would use DG, like they would use a, decom a decomposed or compressed granite. Okay. So similar to the one at Christie Park, um, that would be the kind of surface we'd use a permeable space that um, it wouldn't be wildflowers at a dog park. That actually would probably be harmful to dogs because most of the, some of the seeds and things would actually get into dog paws and things like that. Anyone else? That was good to me. Everyone's just okay with it, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everyone likes it. So I'm going to, um, <laughs> very quick study session. Um, so I'm going to recommend the things I've already stated and just ask if there's council support for, I guess I'll just ask if there's council support for all of those things. Yes. 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 Member Pry Force, do you support? Yes. 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 Council, do you feel you have, or council staff, do you feel you have direction? Yes, we do. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Madam Clerk, time is 7 16. That meeting is adjourned. Very quick meeting. Okay, the time is 7 16. I'd like to call to order the City of Emeryville as successor agency to the Emeryville Redevelopment Agency. And I would just like to ask if the clerk would take the roll call. Councilmember Carr. Present. Councilmember Mora. Present. Councilmember Pryforce. Here. Here. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Welch. Here. And Mayor Batters. Here. Okay, thank you. Uh, at this time, I will entertain a motion to approve the final agenda. I move approval of the final agenda. Second. Okay. 
Motion by Welch, second by Mora to approve the agenda. Please call the roll. Council Member Carr? Aye. Council Member Mora? Aye. Council Member Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. Are there any ex parte communications for people to report this evening for the redevelopment agency? Okay, seeing and hearing none, now is the time for public comment. A member of the public wishing to comment on the redevelopment agency or items not on the agenda for the redevelopment agency have two minutes. I see no hands online and I see nobody present asking to comment. Comment is closed. We'll turn to the consent calendar. Members, are there any questions or comments on the consent calendar? Seeing and hearing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Thank you, motion Welch. Second, Mora to approve items 6.1 and 6.2. Please call the roll. Council Member Carr? Aye. Council Member Mora? Aye. Council Member Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. That item is approved. Item 7.1 is a resolution of the City Council of Emeryville as successor agency for a contract to with Innovative Construction Solutions in an amount of $7.5 million for the FMW site demolition and excavation project. Um, Council, is there an interest in hearing this entire proposal this evening? Or have you read the report? This is I read the report. Is there anybody who objects to a request to waive the presentation for this item? Okay, presentation has been waived. It's available for staff to answer questions if needed. Now is the time for public comment. A member of the public wishing to comment on the redevelopment contract will have two minutes to do so. Seeing no people present, public comment is closed. Is there any discussion on this item, members? I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Motion by Mora. Second by Welch to approve. Please call the roll. Council Member Carr? Aye. Council Member Mora? Aye. Council Member Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. Thank you. Madam Clerk, the time is 719. That meeting is adjourned. The time is 719. I would like to call to order the City of Emeryville's regular City Council meeting. For today, Tuesday, September, I'm sorry, October 17th, 2023. Madam Clerk, please note that all members remain present for this meeting. This time I'll entertain a motion to approve this agenda. I move approval of the final agenda. Second. Okay, motion by Welch, second by Carr to approve the agenda. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Carr? Aye. Council Member Mora? Aye. Council Member Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye, thank you. Item four is special orders of the day, a presentation by the Alameda County Healthy Homes Department. Are they here yet? Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi you'd like to uh, come on up and give your presentation? Sure. Um, I have a, um, a packet for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, um, I'm here to talk about our many programs that we have that's available to um, Emeryville um, owners, homeowners in particular, but also um, tenants can also benefit from some of these uh, services we have as well. Um, so my name is Morgan. I'm a community outreach worker. I've been with the county for about five years, but with the department for four years. Um, my particular role in the department is I do in-home consultations for lead poisoning prevention. Um, we worked for identifying lead hazards in homes. And so um, particularly we work with um, Alameda County in more uh, specific Emeryville, um, Oakland, Berkeley, and um, Emeryville, Oakland, Berkeley, and oh my God. Alameda. Thank you. <laughs> so. Um, so we provide um, in-home consultations to those um, own homeowners. Um, if tenants are interested, we also offer that. That's what my role is there. Um, and so, um, next slide. So primarily our services are geared towards keeping homes safe. And so a lot of that has to do with keeping homes um, free from lead hazards, but also, um, you know, other potential hazards that can, um, you know, hinder children in their growth, but also um, providing safe and healthy um, home environments for everyone that would be um, possibly at risk of, you know, having challenges because of um, healthy homes that aren't really up to par. Um, we provide a lot of services to children. We have um, 
many uh, services as far as like nursing um, services that we work with, uh, public health nurses that go and meet with children that are um, have high uh, lead poisoning. Um, we they have lead poisoning. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. So I apologize. You're doing fabulous. Don't worry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So um, so uh, a lot of the children that we see have uh, lower levels of um, lead poison lead poisoning. However, we do work with um, with higher levels as well. And, and the nurse practitioners, the our health team will work with those uh, families to help identify the lead poisoning hazard and then we work with um, our housing side that will help eliminate some of those challenges with a lot of the programs that we offer which can eliminate the housing sources that we find. Um, next slide. So um, in-home consultations is what I had originally mentioned. Um, it really is geared towards, um, you know, lead hazards uh, because a lot of the funding that we get is for um, identifying ha lead hazards in homes. Um, but we want to start also working towards having healthy homes in general. We're doing like, you know, a lot of mold information for families, um, asthma related issues, um, you know, pests. We have a lot of issues we find in general when I'm going into the homes, I see these concerns, and so we like to um, address those as well. Um, and so anyone in those four counties is eligible for this consultation. Um, we've been doing a lot of um, outreach, and uh, it's been pretty um, successful. Um, not so much in Emeryville, because it's such a small, I think, um, you know, city, but we do want to, as much as possible, promote it wherever we can. Um, and then we do minor home repair, which is um, a relatively, um, it's not a newer program, but what we offer is about for um, individuals who are qualified, they get $3,000 of um, minor home repair funds from Alameda County. And um, when we go to the next slide, I can explain more about like what that would look like. And then lead hazard control is a, a big part of our funding. Uh, we do, um, we have a $10,000 grant that is for anyone in Alameda County that can help towards eliminating lead hazards in the home that's um, property based. So if we find that as a home is, um, you know, a hazard to um, particularly families that are low income, we can help eliminate those hazards. The qualification for that is just so that the tenant has to qualify, not the owner. So the tenant would need to be within the income limits, but also need to have a child that is a frequent um, visitor or a resident of that, that location to qualify for that. Um, and we also, um, in that, we have a $5,000 grant that's added to that, that is for healthy homes so other than the lead grant, we also have um, funding for if we find any minor home repair issues that we can use those $5,000 funds for. Um, it could be something small as like repairing floor tiles, it could be electrical outlets, it could be plumbing issues, things like that. So it's all combined when we do the initial assessment. Uh, next slide. So again, um, we it's owner occupant. So uh, right now, what would qualify someone is for the minor home repair? You would have to be um, the owner of the um, of the property, and we fix. As you can see, many of the um, listed items. They're very. It's it's can't be extremely high in cost, but a lot of these we will address. We can. Ref we can fix carpets, we can fix um, stairs, we can fix handrails. A lot of it has to do with also the elder population, but they might need, you know, replace handrails, they might need extra support in the bathroom, um, the shower. We do, we find ourselves doing a lot of work like that. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, so it's again, $3,000. Um, we. We frequently work with um, a lot of individuals, again, out in those four counties. Um, and right now there's, a, unfortunately, a wait list in Oakland, right? But we are open for other counties as well, the, the th other three that I mentioned. Uh, next slide. 
So going back to um, the grant for lead hazard control, uh, we have $10,000 on the right-hand side, you'll see um, the what the pre-application would look like. And what we really like to have is for, um, we have a, if you go to our website, there's pretty much a, 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 a list of things you can, if you qualify, it'll lead you to that page. So um, oftentimes people qualify for the lead hazard control grant, but they also qualify for an in-home consultation or they qualify for minor home repair. So we try to link people where they would mostly benefit um, from our services. So again, it's just a pre-application. It shows you the, the qualifications, which are the income requirements and the child under six in the home or a frequent visitor of the home. Um, and we do a lot of work um, extensively, um, really remediating a lot of the hazards. It's gonna be more of like painting. It's, gonna, it's not gonna be any like removal of, you know, any kind of housing components. It's just a lot of repainting, but we do it in a safe way so that they're not, you know, considered um, more at risk for lead hazards. Next slide. So that's my program. Um, in-home consultation. Really, I find a lot that um, new homeowners are interested in having someone come out and look at their home to see what lead hazards are present. We have a lot of families that just wanna know if there's work to be done in their home, what takes priority? And so um, my idea that I work with is, you know, we spend most of our time inside. If we are working from home, if we, um, you know, have small children, we're inside most of the time. So most of what I work with is any hazards that are inside the home are what should be addressed first. And then we work from there. We work from the outside of the home and then we talk about uh, what needs to be done um, maybe in the, um, the yard, the soil, if there's issues um, in the uh, exterior part of the home. And then I give them a, a summary of what we discussed and also resources and um, other information that they might need for um, how to remediate those issues. Um, and that's also only available to these um, four cities. Next slide. Um, again, we do a lot of outreach. We do, um, we do a lot of tabling events. We, um, we have a lot of connections with um, the uh, community-based organizations that we try to engage with. Myself, personally, I've been working with, um, with staff that work with um, the city of Emeryville um, that you know, really engage a lot with the, um, the senior population, um, community outreach, and um, the, just trying to get our word out there and wanting people to know that this is definitely available to everyone that qualifies in Emeryville. And it's kind of hard to get um, some uh, people from Emeryville to grab on. So uh, next slide. So um, again, we do the in-home consultations, minor home repair for um, the eligible individuals for $3,000. The in-home consultation is completely free and it's, um, we can also do a follow-up visit as well if they have more questions. Um, we do um, property owner education and services. What I wanted to mention there is if you're a homeowner in um, any of the four cities, we offer um, a free RRP training, which is a, a lead, it gets you certified for lead safety. So if you see work being done, if there's work being done in your home or you wanna be someone to supervise work getting done um, safely, um, we give you a certificate for that, but you just have to be an owner of a home in the four cities. Um, we offer um, education. We do, I've been reaching out also to other agencies also to do um, the healthy homes aspect. Also, uh, we do daycare, child programs. We do a lot of trainings with those, with those individuals to help the families identify where the lead hazards could be. And then um, we do case management of lead poisoned children all over Alameda County. That's with our public health nurses and with our um, community outreach workers as well. And that's what I used to do before I did the housing side, so. Um, next slide, I think that's it. Okay. <laughs> so um, yeah, so my name is Morgan. Um, I have my card, I'll stay till the end. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we are, 
looking for everyone who's interested in, you know, our uh, social media. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry. It, Morgan, you did fabulous. So if you, <laughs> you did fabulous, because I'm going to guess that this isn't something you do every day. No. So no. you did this just fine. This is actually fine. my first one, my first meeting, like to do this this way. So I Well, I, I promise Sony Johnson, who's I'm sure watching us, um, I'm going to give her positive <laughs> feedback on this. I'm going to tell uh, Larry Brooks that you did a great job. I, w I will. I will. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, first just see if there's public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on the special order of the day because it is a community program? Okay, and then I'll bring it back here. Um, it's not a discussion item. It's just a presentation technically, but are there any questions members have for our presenter, Vice Mayor Welch? Hi, Morgan. Thank you Hi. for coming out tonight and sharing this very valuable information with us. One question I just had just about the process. Um, how quickly is the turnaround typically when you first reach out to get the ball rolling? How long could um, homeowners expect for the process to go on or does it depend on what the issues may be? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. So um, the in-home consultation um, is so each program is separate. So that one in particular, we try to reach out with when they reach, most of the time they reach out via um, online. So they come to our website um, and then they fill out a questionnaire and then we reach out to them within 48 hours. And at that point then that I get that information and I reach out to them within 40 hours again. Now with um, the lead hazard control, it's usually the same with um, the grant to fix the um, lead hazards. And then a minor home repair, it's the same. Now when the processes are also very different. So mine is like, I come in one time and then also I might do a second follow up visit, but most of the time it's quick because it's one, one visit. Mm -hmm. But if they qualify for the um, LHC, the, the lead grant, then it could proceed to moving to a different part of our department. So they can actually move towards getting an actual physical um, uh, inspection of their home using you know, an XRF gun and people are taking samples. Um, and that, that can actually take a lot longer depending on if it's the homeowner that's living in the unit or if it's a tenant that's living in the unit and whether or not that relationship is amicable enough so that we can work with them um, to get the work going. Um, and then that also takes a couple of visits before the work can actually start getting done. And then minor home repair is fairly simple as, as is my program where it's, they, they, once they fill out the paperwork, we can send someone out within the week or two. Um, again, Oakland has a, it's, it's very, it's, there's like a year waiting list at this point, oh. um, just because it's a high need right now in Oakland. And so, um, but it's, it's just Oakland. So we do still encourage people to get on the list. And so then, um, and we're, we're doing a good job of triaging people to where they would, you know, benefit most from our services. But yeah, so we are definitely looking for people for all the cities. Okay. Thank you so much. There's no questions. Council Member Mora. Thank you for this information. I, th this is great to know, and, and thanks for looking out for the residents in Emeryville. Uh, one question I had is around um, you know, uh, for lead in water or pipes. Is that is something that your organization also can test for or look at? Good question. So we are working with East Bay Mud, actually. Um, in certain areas in West Oakland, there are concerns of there being um, you know, the pipes aren't in the homes and they're concerned about there being um, lead in the pipes um, and they're doing their own testing. And so um, I could definitely give you that information after this because we are working with them. We don't, we know that in Alameda County, the water is tested um, on a very frequent basis. So that is most of, if not all of the, um, the work that we've done with families around their lead poisoned children, it's never been water that's caused the lead exposure. It's um, other issues. And so um, oftentimes people are really, really focused on water being a concern, primarily because of what we've heard in the media about other areas. Um, but we haven't had that concern in our department. We do like to say though that in older homes, it is a concern. And so that's why uh, East Bay Mud is conducting their own program. Well, they will actually um, reach out to certain 
zip codes, if you wish, if I can figure another way to say it, to identify which ones could possibly have that issue, and then they'll give them testing kits, and then they could follow up from there. Um, I can't speak to what they offer if they do find that there's lead hazards, um, but I do know that we are trying to work with them so that we can get some type of, um, some of that, you know, concern to help the population because I know people are worried about that. Um, but in West Oakland, I know that there's some concerns about that. Um, but yeah, so we, we personally don't have anything, but it's because we haven't found that to be a, a source of lead hazards for um, children or lead poisoning. I see, thank you. Yeah. Bruce, you do, Council Member Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Morgan, so much for all this inf really valuable information. I have a few questions, if I may. Uh, what is the eligibility to qualify for these grants? So um, the, the minor home repair is just a homeowner, um, and we you have to there's an income requirement, and I don't have that in front of me, but um, the income requirement for the minor home repair is the same as the lead hazard control. So um, I can definitely provide that to you. Also, it's on our website, and um, those are the requirements for that for the in-home consultation. All you have to be is a homeowner in those four cities, and we will come out and we will do an in-home consultation. Um, we also have a program where we offer the um, four cities a uh, complimentary, a lack of a better word, bucket we offer <laughs> with some little um, good housing, um, safe housing type of items in it that I bring when I go to do an in-home consultation. Um, it's not really much, but it, it it's nice to receive a little, you know, goodie when you go out um, but no so um, it's it's really income based and the only other caveat to the grant uh, for the lead hazard control is that the, there has to be a child that frequents the the, um, the house uh, that's under six yeah Thank before, you. You, before you go on can I just ask to clarify one thing a pre-1978 home yes and so I'm glad you mentioned that because um, what we find lately is that we're we're moving towards a pre-1960 so um it is pre-1978 pre is what we've been working towards in the past but what we find is that we're not finding enough lead hazards in homes that are bef uh, that are um not that are before 19 like i'm sorry between 60 and 78 yes yeah so um that means like when i go to in-home consultation and a home is built in 1965 um the likelihood that there's a, a not a significant amount, but an, a lead to to require a lead grant for ten thousand dollars is really low. So we try to keep it to where we're we're providing this to people that have homes that are older than 1960. So it's really important that I I, I say that because I feel like when I go out I have to remember that it's like you know 1965 isn't necessarily going to have very much lead, and we we actually have a lot of data that that proves that um, and so when we when we give these this information we actually try to also promote um, you know housing community development in Alameda County they have a lot of services for different types of um, grants for housing repairs that have nothing to do with lead so I bring all this information with me so that they know that you don't have to just you know lead might get us in there but you might have other needs that you have that our grant won't cover you know so um, but primarily it's 1960 uh, that we're working towards. Thank you so much for that information. I do have some more questions. Yes. How long is this available? Goodness. There's no time limit. Uh, there is no time limit. Um, I'm glad that you know this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, the, I'm the city's yeah. representative to the yeah. board. Okay, um, so great. it's one of our annual boards and I, you're doing a great job. Thank you. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to help you with that one. So we annually get a grant from HUD to the county and county administers the lead hazard and r minor repair grants. And so that grant, sometimes the amount varies every year that we get, but we there's no like time clock on people to do it. Like it's currently until future notice, there's such an unmet need, particularly in East and West Oakland neighborhoods that, that we continue to get funding for it. Thank you, that's good to know. And the outreach that you do um, for this, I'm glad that you're here today because I think a lot of people don't know about this. Yeah. Uh, if you are requested to present at um, uh, HOA or a renters association, would you be open to doing that? I would 
would love to. I actually wanted to, and I looked into like what we have available in Emeryville, and Emeryville is such an up-and-coming city that it's hard to find um, HOAs that have the, I guess, the age requirement for the homes that are built. And so um, it definitely, if there's something that I can, I would love to do that. I'm really, we, we have you know, benchmarks we'd like to hit, right? And so if we can't get just one in Emeryville, we need to get one, right? So, um, and I know that, you know, it's, it's a small city, but I know that, you know, people would definitely need a lot of our services, so. Um, yeah, I live in a, in a pre-1978 complex inhabited by 3,000 people almost. Uh, yeah, so we would welcome you to give a presentation over there. If you could share your information with me, Absolutely. that'd be very... And, and we would do the in-home consultation for any home that's pre-1978. Like, that's what we offer as far as, like, the other grants. It's difficult also to find people that qualify for the um, lead hazard control. So we're always looking for something to offer the CSA properties, so... Wonderful. One more question is, um, so you said they are buckets. Is there... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so do you have, is, does, does Emeryville have a specific dollar amount in, the, in our bucket or it doesn't matter because Oakland has a waiting list. Do we have a waiting list or you don't have anyone from Emeryville who has applied yet? So the bucket is um, a program that is, uh, it's for all of CSA, but it, it literally has, I guess it's been kind of difficult to take off. So because um, it's hard to find what people really like for the bucket. Right, so we've had, you know, like um, painting prep in there. We've had, um, you know, wet sanding blocks. We've had, um, you know, eye safety wear. We've had gloves. It's, it's very, um, it, it works for some people, but for some it doesn't. So it was hard for us to take off. Now we've realized that um, without having to request it, because what they had to do was get a, a, almost like a little voucher and then go to one Ace Hardware that was in um, East Oakland that's not suitable for people who would want to go out there from out here, right? So we had to figure out another way to do it. So now we're revamping it. And so I take it when I go to do in-home consultations because I'm already seeing people that are, you know, you know, they are eligible for our services. So, um, but it is, it's, there's no waiting list. If people want that, it's also on the, on the um, website. And we're revamping it now, but it's, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I wasn't clear in my question. I think by, by bucket, I meant the, um, that was, that's lovely of you to offer that bucket in the first place, but I actually meant a bucket of the, uh, this, or a ceiling of the dollar amount that you have for each city, oh, the grant. No. There isn't one. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> that's that's, that's okay. fine. I wasn't very clear over there, but thank you so much. Yeah, Valerie, would you like to come up for a moment? So the city actually has about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars that's allocated through the community development block grant that goes to the minor home repair program. Um, she's extremely correct. We have not served a lot of people. I think we've been averaging maybe about one or two a year. There had been a big slowdown during the pandemic, but finding people for the minor home repair program has just been difficult. Um, but we have about twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars that's allocated out of our annual CDBG um, grant towards the minor home repair program, and on the lead hazard program, we have not served anybody in quite a bit of time. Um, there's not a direct allocation for Emeryville. I think it's a part of their overall bucket for the county, mm -hmm. and we're just an eligible city. Go ahead. One more question: Do you have to be a homeowner, or can you be a renter to qualify? Minor home repair. Yes. You, okay. Yeah, use the microphone so everyone at home can hear you there. Go ahead. Oh, yep. You have to be a homeowner. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I appreciate that because we uh, there's a an event happening on the 28th, right? So I'm planning on yep. I'm going to that. Like I want to like just I'm very like you know personable and I like to be very transparent. So I really want to like just explain to people like this is it's. It can be hard to engage people to receive free money, which is kind of strange, but it happens, right? So there's challenges. So, but I, I'm gonna be there at the event that you guys are having. I think it's a fall fest. The um, Harvest Festival, yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna be there, and I I wanna you definitely explain these services to people. Um, and again, like we 
if you if anyone has any questions they can reach out to me directly and then i can lead them to the right person to talk to so thank you so much. thank you thank you so much for being here this evening um i'll just add that next week is uh, national lead poisoning prevention week yeah and um emeryville is one of just a handful of jurisdictions in the united states that adopted the epa's uh, rrp rule formally so anybody who comes to do a minor home repair on a pre-1978 structure has to be lead certified it's an advisory for in the uh, the code of federal regulations but we adopted it as a rule so people actually get trained here in the county through your department um, so one of the reasons we dropped to zero lead poisoning cases in our city is because we don't have people conducting repairs to lead painted homes um, with fugitive dust flying out from it that's getting into yards and neighboring yards and backgrounds where kids it's tactile and they're getting it in their mouths and they're getting poisoned um, so we've done a great job on that and we have a very as you noted very small stock of housing that's old yeah. um, and so there is one HOA on the very far west side of the city that is pre-1978 and then we kind of have a cluster of um, single family to quadplex homes on the east side of the city but most of everything in between is um, in a way, luckily, not built in a time when it was used with toxic materials. So, uh, but sitting on that board, I, I will say, like, we, we've struggled with the challenge at McClyman's High School with their water fountains and their pipes um, being lead based and poisoning the football team a couple years ago. We've had incidents in our neighboring jurisdictions around this. And these grants, um, I would say the biggest challenge with them is landlords. Um, the biggest challenge is landlords. Single family homeowners, if they find that they get the test done and they want to do it, they'll do it because it's safety for them, but it's interesting when you get a landlord to come in uh, because some of them are grants and some of them are loans. It depends on the programs they go yeah. through. And landlords are interestingly more resistant to taking um, the money because they, they don't know what that means for them. They're afraid that will harm their rental income, other things, um, which is an unfortunate thing. Um, but we haven't had a problem here. We've, in the sense that we haven't had a poisoning problem. Yeah. So um, thankfully the health outcomes have been okay. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of great work being done by advocates like yourself. I'm just really grateful you took your evening to come here and um, your information is on the slides and we have it. But if you would like to, if you have, you know, personal information you want to leave. Um, oh, for sure. I'll leave you my card. I would love to do a presentation. That would be great if you could do that. That'd be yeah. great. And uh, just one more quick thing. Sure. Um, with our lead hazard control um, and I, I, we are running into a lot of challenges with um, with just the climate I guess we're dealing with you know tenants versus landlords at this point so um, we try to explain like the lead hazard control grant we, we ask for very minimal information from tenants and it's really just income information and if you have a lot of people in your home that don't work you just sign an affidavit saying that you don't have an income and um, I work with a lot of landlords that like you know, they're, they want the information to give, but then they're worried that it's gonna cause challenges in the future with them proceeding against the tenants. And so um, we work with both, and I feel like that's what's great, is that we try to support both tenants and landlords. So, um, but yeah, it is a challenge sometimes, but thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for coming this evening and for your work. Okay. Thank you. Item five is announcements of commission and committee vacancies, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I wanted to let you know that we received a resignation on the Public Art Committee. Sabrina Sellers uh, resigned. We were able to add her position to the recruitment that closed on Monday. Um, the advisory body appointments will be coming before the Council at the November 7th special meeting. Okay, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Council members, special announcements or reports of meetings they've attended? Okay, see, oh, Council Member Carr? No, I don't. Oh. I do not. Okay, seeing and hearing none, the City Manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one thing, um, as the previous speaker mentioned, I also want to make sure everybody knows that they're invited to our Harvest Festival. It's October 28th uh, from 11 to 5 at the New Park, which is pronounced Huchun Park. And I'm thankful to the uh, the Confederated Villages of Lisjaw Nation for correcting us on the pronunciation and the spelling of the New Park. Um, we're very excited for that event. I also want to thank our Community Services Director, Rebecca Sermeno for all the work that she's done. It's gonna be a super fun event uh, and hope to see you all there. That's it, thank you. Thank you. Ex parte communications, are there any members who wish to report a meeting or a conversation they've had about an item on this evening's agenda? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Uh, now is the time for public comment for the consent calendar and items not on this agenda. A member of the public who wishes to give comment for a non-agenda item will have two minutes to do so. And I'd like to recognize online Jen Grand Le Lejano, please. 
Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Jen Gramlahano, Senior Government Relations Director with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I specialize in local policy to reduce youth access to tobacco across Northern California. Um, we have been working here well, to engage the community in local policy to reduce tobacco marketing to youth called Rooted in Community Empowerment. As you may know, there is a statewide law to end the sale of most flavored tobacco products. And that law went into effect last December. But the new state law has limited resources for enforcement and relies on local jurisdictions to make sure that the state law is implemented. So local cities have the authority to go beyond state law to restrict tobacco sales and collect a fee to fund local implementation and enforcement. Um, most jurisdictions in Alameda County have adopted um, policies to do this, as well as neighboring Contra Costa County and over 140 jurisdictions across California. So Emeryville still has the opportunity to join them, and we found that there is a need. Despite the statewide law to end the sale of most flavored tobacco products, there are still flavored tobacco products being sold illegally at stores in Emeryville. And in fact, there's been an increase in the number of tobacco retailers from eight to now 12 retailers. Um, most local high school students survey report uh, easy access to tobacco products. And we all know how addictive and devastating these products can be to teen brain development and general health as tobacco is still the leading preventable cause of cancer and all deaths in California. So our project is working with Alameda County tobacco control staff to educate and engage the community around this issue and work with city council to discuss evidence-based policy solutions to, to reduce the tobacco disease burden in Emeryville through um, local licensing policy and provide technical assistance to staff. Uh, my colleague Kristen Lockhart has reached out to all city council members to start the conversation thank and you. we look forward to working with you to make sure it all can join its neighbors. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. The next speaker will be Sharon Wiltshire, please. Good evening. Huge. Oh, yes. Well, first of all, uh, all of us in the neighborhood are really looking forward to the opening of the new city park. Very exciting. But also, um, just to mention, thank you to all of you who attended the opening for the Emeryville Art Exhibition and have been there to visit since then. But the exhibition is also open through the end of the month on the 29th, Wednesday through Sunday, um, from 11 to 6 every day. Thank you. Just wanted to put that out there. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a fantastic event. Any other members of the public wishing to give comment for non-agenda items? OK, seeing and hearing none. Turn to the consent calendar. Members, there are items 10.1 through 10.13 before you for consent. Does any member wish to pull an item or consider it further? Seeing none, comment having been taken on this items already, is there a motion on the consent calendar? I move approval of the consent calendar. I'll second. Thank you, motion by Welch, second by Mora to approve 10.1 through 10.11. Uh, Please call the roll. Council member Carr. 13, sorry. Aye. Yeah. Council member Mora. Aye. Council member Pryforce is absent. Vice Mayor Welch. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. Just to clarify for the record, Madam Clerk, I said 10.11, but I meant 13. That was the motion. So, all right. That um, before we continue, members, um, if you, by a show of hands, if you're in the audience, how many people are here for the purchase of the artwork? Uh, members, by seeking your unanimous consent, I'd like to move item 12.2 to the next item on the agenda. Does anybody object to that request? No. Okay, we're going to take item 12.2 next, please. We have a staff presentation. Oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Did Amber go? What We, we, we sent Amber away. She thought it was going to be a little bit. <laughs> That's all right. I kind of got the feeling there might be some people who are here for some art celebration in the room, and I wanted to make sure we didn't keep you all evening through the transportation plan. Hi, Amber. We decided to let you go home early. <laughs> um, I just wanted to introduce our new consultant to this project, Sharman Bakhti Roundtree. Hi, and Sharman. Come on up. Hi. And she will present to you this presentation. Oh, thank you, Amber. Good evening, City Council, Mayor, Hi. and staff, and public. <laughs> I think you guys are out in the They're Zoom, out there. Zoomverse. <laughs> My name is Sharman Bakhti, and I've been working with the city probably almost close to a year um, working on the bus shelter project as well as the purchase award. I originally joined the team as a panelist 
for last year's Purchase Award. So it's an honor to be involved as a consultant and a member um, of the community. So I'd like to just give you all a, um, a summary of um, the Purchase Award selection process and also um, ask for your approval for the two artists who are recommended for purchase and to also acknowledge um, the artists in attendance who received uh, a notable honor. Next slide, please. So I think Sharon Wilcher is on the call. And um, Sharon is the founder, I'm sure all of you know, of Emory Art Center. And I just wanted to acknowledge that she and her team did an amazing job um, with this year's um, exhibition, which opened, I believe, a couple weeks ago. So this year, we received um, 180 artworks um, as part of the Emory um, e exhibition, which was representing over 126 local artists, which is a really great turnout, very impressive, more so than I believe last year. Um, there were a couple of artworks that weren't eligible for purchase, um, and the reasoning for that are, is listed there under the bulleted items. So we have some items that obviously were not for sale. Um, items that were pur um, purchased with, or artists that had purchases within the last five years. And obviously if there was a conflict of interest, note it note there in bullet number three. Next slide. So as part of the selection um, panel, the city um, looks to make a very sort of diverse um, group of uh, jurors as participants. Um, usually there's two local artists, I'm uh, sorry, two local art professionals, one staff member, um, a member of the community, as well as a member um, representing um, the Emory Celebration of the Arts. So this year for our professional, um, local art, art professionals, we had two, um, two panelists, Derek Bell, who is an arts educator for the city of Oakland and also a practicing artist. Um, and we also have Ben Trotman, who is a practicing artist, but he also has a background in architecture. So he's got this very keen sensibility about um, execution and, and thinking about 3D work as well. Alyssa Chung from the city um, graced us, um, which was awesome to have her on, on the team as well. Um, Francis Gaston, who is a longtime member of the board, I think probably 15 years or so, um, was also on one of the jury uh, panelists. And uh, Zoe Schaff, who I believe is on the um, planning committee. Next slide, please. So as part of the selection process, there are a number of items um, that were considered by the panelists, um, including the aesthetics of the piece, um, general public appeal, because these are um, artworks that are being considered for purchase and, and, and installation in, on city property. Um, the curatorial focus, as well as sort of the longevity, are these pieces, um, pieces that uh, uh, members of the public would be engaged with over a period of time, um, are, would they be offensive any sort of way? Um, you know, is this something that we could, the city would consider to be a, a good investment? The selection process involved um, the the jurors having an opportunity to to walk around the exhibition space and actually choose um, sort of their their top five pieces to start with. And the group met together um, after having a tour of the potential sites for the purchases because we wanted the panelists to be thinking about um, the purchase, but also where that purchase would potentially live. Um, those sites included uh, City Hall, um, the Senior Center, as well as the Community Center. Seven pieces were chosen collectively um, to sort of like have discussion over. Um, those seven pieces um, were viewed again and talked about and, and as a group. And, and there, were, there were five pieces that um, 
were chosen by at least two panelists. And so for, from those five, the group kind of decided like which pieces would be considered for purchase. Um, I won't go through with too much more detail, but um, the, sh the short of it or the long of it, long short of it, I can't remember, but <laughs> um, is that uh, the committee actually chose two, two pieces um, that ranked basically the exact same score and couldn't decide between the two, um, as well as another piece um, uh, that did not rank at quite as high as the other two pieces, but pe the panelists felt very strongly about and felt should be recognized. Um, so those two pieces, actually all three, um, were brought to the attention of the PAC, and the PAC um, had the op uh, opportunity to, to sort of make the decision about which piece or pieces to purchase, and they decided to purchase, that the recommendation would be to purchase both, and to um, obviously move forward with the um, honorable mention. Next slide, please. As I mentioned previously, there were seven um, artists who ranked as part of the top seven. Their names are listed there. And the following individuals um, had art, artworks that were, were reconsidered by the panel. So again, there were the seven that are listed there were um, ranked high for all of the panelists. Um, but there were a couple artists that stood out um, even beyond those that we wanted to reconsider. Um, Frank Cole and John Whitefield. Next slide, please. Sorry, Whitehead, excuse me. <laughs> so the two um, artworks, um, sorry, the two artists that were recommended to move forward included Mike Ferrugia for his work, um, Dollar Store. Next slide, please and Erin Fong for her work, to actually three pieces, a part of the cl cr chroma clusters. And before I move forward, I just wanted to recognize that the artists who are being considered are here today, Erin Fong and Mike Ferrugia, as well as John Whitehead. Next slide, please. And last, but definitely not, least John Whitehead's um, sculpture piece entitled The Newman of Wood. Next slide please. So a bit about the artist. Um, Mike Ferrugia is a multidisciplinary artist. His work is influenced by dimensional experimentation and reuse. It's currently on view at the Bedford Gallery as part of the Recology Artist in Residency Retrospective Traveling Exhibition. I sit on the board for Recology um, so when I saw that he had this association, I was really excited um, to see that the city would consider purchasing works that have an emphasis on reuse. Um, Aaron Fong is a letterpress printer and multidisciplinary artist who creates art that celebrates the power of color, human connection, and experimentation. Her, work, her works range from prints and painting to large-scale site-specific installations. Fong's work was recently selected for the city's annual bus shelter program and will be on display January through April 2025. I should mention that um, although Aaron's work is two-dimensional, it has a very sort of immersive quality to it. A lot of her work is um, focused on, in color theory. So I think it's, it's a nice, the, the panel felt like it was a nice uh, addition. Um, Mr. John Whitehead is a sculpture artist working with metal and wood materials. His work is largely influenced by abstract geometric shapes, contemporary patterns, and African diasporic paradigms. His work has been included in the last four Emeryville Celebration of the Arts exhibitions. Um, Mr. Whitehead has um, been a practicing artist for, for many, many years. Um, the panel, as well as the PAC, um, were really enthusiastic to see his work being recognized. Um, the craftsmanship is um, definitely one that should be celebrated, so also glad that he's being considered as well. Next slide. Regarding the budget, um, 
I don't know if you were able to see really quickly on those slides, um, but um, here's a breakdown of the budget, which includes um, the stipends f um, for the panelists. The panelists are um, offered $150 honorarium. Um, there's my fee, <laughs> the art consultant um, helping to manage the project. Um, the event associated with sort of honoring um, the purchase award, the budget is allocated as $1,400. The plaques recognizing the artists and um, noting the media and the, the year. Um, there is a budget of $1,000. Um, the artwork in total, um, 4000 for um, Mike Ferrugia's piece and the remaining for Aaron Fong's works. Um, and the installation estimate is up to 6000 for a total of 24500 Next slide, please. Oh, is that it? All right, that's it. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Are there any questions about the recommendation or the presentation? Okay, thank you. You can have a seat. And this time I'll call for public comment. Thank you. Members of the public who wish to give comment on item 12.2 will have two minutes to do so. You can come up to the microphone if you'd like to give comment. Good evening, John. Can you I'm try to use the microphone so people at home can hear you? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm John Whitehead, the uh, the person that got first honorarium for the uh, my sculpture, Newman of Wood. Uh, I have two concerns, so to speak. I think this is the first time that we have a tie. I'm not sure about that. I think we, you can give just your comment for two minutes, and then I have to stop your comment, but we can take questions afterwards if you have a question. Okay. Go ahead and ask me, and I'll ask them when they come back up. Uh, because it kind of put me in a real weird position. Usually, when you get the green uh, award or whatever, that's considered uh, first honorarium. And in essence, historically, you call that second place. If you're advertising, if you're uh, linking it to uh, a show or something, you say you took second place with Emeryville Arts. Uh, however, I'm a little puzzled because I put that out there, but in essence, I have two people in front of me. So how do you resolve something like that? I guess I have to go down to third then. <laughs> Send it out, or is there another solution in terms of how you guys can present it when you link it? You, you have to, your comment is to, is to me, you have a two okay. minute clock. So just ask your questions to me and then when that, we're done, I can that, ask. That, that, is, that is it. So is it any way possible to, uh, when you present it uh, to the public, that it reflects a second place? Understood. That's the question. Because that's basically how it's been historically. And the second question is, is there any way possible that the criteria that you use, that that criteria is presented uh, at the very beginning when you send out the, uh, the, the publicity for the, uh, for the art, when, so artists will know what they're being judged by when they put up their work. A lot of people are not even aware of how it's being judged. I think that should go in front so that somebody's not coming to the show and they say, how did I get second? You know, so like, that kind of thing, that's it. Thank you, John. Are there any other members of the public who wish to give comment for this item? And I see no hands raised online. I'll close public comment. I'd like to invite Amber and Charmin to come up to the microphone, please. I have a couple questions for you before we kick off discussion. My first question is, um, what are the criteria that are used for judging and how is that information made public to artists who submit? I'll answer the second question and then go back to the first. Um, the, the solicitation for the Celebration of Arts show does not um, n mention any of the criteria. It is noted in their brochure that the city will, by tradition since for several years now, brought a piece. Um, the criteria for the show are quite separate and process for the show. So that is what they focus on in that brochure. Um, when the city goes 
we have five criteria use them since the beginning of the uh, selection for the purchase award since 2006 um, and they I don't know if you have them off the top of my head I might have them off the top of my head aesthetics longevity curatorial focus gotta say those into the microphone so everyone can hear that aesthetics um, longevity curatorial focus and I believe um, is it placement Location? No, location has not been location has not been an explicit criteria, um, though the panel does discuss and use uh, judgment regarding if there is a, a logical placement for a criteria uh, for a possible purchase. Um, so uh, diversity, I think, was the right, one you yeah. didn't get mentioned, yeah. um, particularly not explicitly to the artists per showing because that is not known at the time the works are being looked at but rather to the media and typology within the collection okay so just to restate so i understand what you said and the council has the same benefit i think um you when you do the advertisement for the brochure you list what the eligibility and submission criteria are and that's generally known but there's five criteria for how you and your panel evaluate who ultimately has the winning piece for your recommendation for selection. Those five criteria, is that placed someplace for people to see? It sounds like you've used it for years. How, how would a person know what that criteria is? Um, we certainly can provide it, but it has not been provided in any public location. There hasn't been. Because of the nature, it is not a call. It has been the panel being provided the packet with the agenda and the other materials, the, the gallery guide, as that's how it's been provided. But we could certainly provide it um, to Sharon to have within, just as they have the um, resumes available, we could have those criteria in a book provided to the artist as well. Okay. Thank you. And then the other question that I would like to reflect from the public commenter is uh, regarding selection. Um, so you have uh, three three pieces here you're recommending for approval tonight. Um, two of them as, or four, four, I'm sorry, but you have two artists that are selected for awards um, and there are different amounts that you've recommended for award. And then you have an honorable mention that you've, you've added to this list. And I think that the question I heard, if I could try to reflect it properly, is um, there's typically kind of um, a winner who gets selected is the kind of idea and then there's maybe you know honorable second or third mentions after that um, i do agree that in my time on the council we have made selections of multiple pieces to win um, that's not that's not a new thing that has happened here before um, but could you just clarify what the parameters around are around how many in a given year you might choose because i do recall a year where we might have even had three that we chose so i want to just see for, for the transparency of how you do the selection process for the benefit of the artist, it might just be helpful to know, do you just give unfettered discretion to the panel to choose how many they want to recommend for an award or do you have some sort of criteria? Sure. What is asked of the panel is that they select one purchase for, for the PAC's recommendation to the council and a first and second honorable mention. That is the direction provided to the panel. Um, in those cases, and there have been prior exact numeric ties, they've been asked to revisit that, or in this time uh, instance, they were t told you could allow the PAC to make that decision between those, since there is not a, um, and their preference was to allow that to move forward without having made a preference between them. Uh, the PAC uh, made the choice to make recommendation. I will say that at, their, at a prior meeting of the Public Art Committee, they discussed whether or not they would, they would try to tighten that curatorial focus down to making sure that they were only moving forward one piece. And they made a very explicit decision um, to consider more, in part because of the ability um, to place the second works in smaller spaces um, where larger spaces had been, they were no longer available um, in many locations. So functionally, when we give someone an honorable mention or a notable commendation, um, what, what, why is there one or why aren't there five, for example, um, or everybody out of the nine? Like what distinguishes it? Because it's not recommended for a purchase, right? So what is distinguishing it? Is it just that the artist gets to claim that they've received a notable 
or honorable mention for a submission to the contest and the, the show, or is there a other functional difference? Um, it historically has been uh, included within the resolution and therefore part of the record for their n notification um, and inclusion in resume as referenced. Um, it is also then something that can be mentioned as the panel is discussing um, future considerations, what the history of the artists, um, awards and considerations have been in the past. Okay. Are there other council members who have questions for the staff? Member Pryforce? Yeah, um, working with kids for a long time. Once you start giving out the medals, it's already too late. Right? <laughs> and so, um, the, um, I mean, unless you start adding medals, but then, you know, people just start complaining about that too. Um, but yeah, I think it, in the future, being able to outline that, um, uh, what, what is exactly that we're, uh, we're looking for you know, in terms of purchase, uh, in terms of uh, what becomes uh, CD art or CD hall art. Uh, yeah, because it, it especially because um, you know, artist objective and uh, that um, for those artists who are trying to do something maybe a little bit more risque or maybe something that's strongly ethnic, um, that uh, the panelists may be thinking, oh, well, that may not be city hall art or city art. And, and so, um, and and then, but you know, if that's where the spirit moves them, um, then at least they can get make that decision as to whether or not they're going to follow some of the guidelines, or they're not going to go rogue and 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 then not follow the guidelines, and they just want to put their art art out there. So I think it would just be 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 helpful um, in the future. And I think you, I mean I think everyone, I, I think everyone has the best intentions, um, but when you do with human beings, you know, you just. We, you always iterate it better for the next time. So that's my, those are my comments. Others who have comments? Um, I, I'm gonna just uh, thank the Public Art Committee for their work. I wanna commend all the artists. Um, I think I, I would agree, I think in the future, um, you know, the there's always opportunities just to improve communication. And I think what I'd like to ask is that uh, whatever the criteria we have, it sounds like there are established criteria. I think we should just make all of the criteria um, public because I think people may choose to submit what they want um, or not submit um, or not submit for the show but not the contest. There could We should give people the freedom of choice in this. This is a very um, open and friendly community about that stuff and I, uh, I just think it's an opportunity for us to improve communication, that's all. Um, so uh, I'm, great, I'm grateful for that. I wanna commend all the artists and thank you all for being here. I wanna, um, all of them are unique mediums and uh, very different uh, pieces. I do wanna say uh, I was really, um, I, I go to the show every year, I run the bar every year, but Mike, I will just tell you that this is the first year where I did the walkthrough at 2 p.m. when I helped set up for the event, and I got to see all the pieces kind of on my own as I was helping set up. Um, and I always, in my mind, like try to pick the piece I like the most, and this year was the first year I picked the piece that won. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I loved your piece, I thought it was fantastic. Um, and so uh, if there's no further discussion on the item, um, I would just like to thank uh, staff and, and Sharman and everybody for coming out this evening and um, I will go ahead and make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. I will second. Okay, thank you. Motion by Bowders and a second by Welch to approve this item. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr? Aye. Councilmember Mora? Aye. Councilmember Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Bowders? Aye. Thank you all for coming this evening and for your participation in our art celebration. Thank you. Okay. Um, we'll go back now to item 11. We have one public hearing this evening. Item 11.1 .1 is the active transportation plan. And uh, Navarre will present that with some other folks, it looks like. Yes. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, it's exciting to be here tonight to present the ATP to you. Um, uh, the only update that I have that's aside from what Jeff Knowles from Alta Planning um, w that I have for you this evening is that for the tribal notification period, we did not receive any comments. So we're free to move forward with this. And um, Jeff has been working on this the entire project. He's uh, been the lead for the um, consultant on this and um, has done an amazing job to get us this far. So uh, Jeff Knowles will come and he will present the presentation for you this evening and both of us of course are here for any questions you may have. 
Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Navar. Good evening, Mayor, members of council, members of the public, city staff. My name is Jeff Knowles. I'm with Alt Planning and Design. I'm your consultant on the city's active transportation plan. Real quick, am I able to advance slides with this keyboard? Okay, next slide. All right. <laughs> the agenda tonight, I'm gonna walk through our community engagement process. I'm going to describe the final plan, and then I'm also going to detail the changes from the first draft plan and the revised draft plan. Next slide. Our project kicked off in the spring of 2021. We have four phases in the development of the active transportation plan. Phase one was to explore. This is where we were analyzing current conditions on the ground, uh, issues facing people who walk and bike and roll to school, to work, uh, for recreation. We listened to community members' visions and needs. Phase two, we moved to that in the fall of 2021, where we started to collaborate on ideas and suggestions for proposed projects like bike lanes and sidewalk locations, programs such as education campaigns for improving walking, biking, and rolling, and really getting community feedback on these early stage ideas. Phase three, we started to refine those ideas, again, with additional public input and members of different stakeholder groups, to refine that and develop a draft, first draft active transportation plan and get additional feedback once we pulled it together. We're here in phase four, the approved phase, and we hope that this happens tonight where we can answer your questions and get this uh, approved. We've got the final active transportation plan that's been presented to city council after going through the BPAC and planning commission along with transportation committee. Next slide. So I'd like to walk through our uh, robust, comprehensive community engagement process. Next slide. There are three phases for this work. We wanted to hear from active transportation users, people who walk, people who bike or roll or use different mobility devices, people that use transit, walking and bicycling to transit as a frequent mode of transportation, as long with people who maybe currently don't walk and bike but would like to, uh, maybe there are barriers that face them. We really looked at our audience as people who live in Emeryville, people who work or study in Emeryville, people who use Emeryville's recreation facilities, parks, the Bay Trail, Bay Bridge Path, people who visit Emeryville to shop or to dine, people who travel through Emeryville. And I'd say we also expanded our original scope to make sure that we had a targeted effort at hearing from low-income retail and hotel workers along with youth. Next slide. We met with the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee nine times throughout the life of this project. So we really looked to them as kind of critical stakeholders in the formation of this plan, getting their buy-in at critical points and uh, getting consensus with them uh, along the way. Transportation Committee, we met with them three times so that there were, uh, ad again, additional members of council working on this plan. We had three listening sessions. This was focused on hotel and retail workers, community members with disabilities, and also families with children. We had a youth outreach event uh, at the um, at Emeryville's uh, recreation summer camp. We had a rolling tour, a bicycle tour, well attended by members of the BPAC and members of the public. Next slide. We had a walking tour. There were three public meetings that were well uh, noticed in advance. Those were all online. We had an online survey, 848 responses to our online survey, which was a really high rate of response for us for a city of this population. Really pleased with the turnout in that. And also we had an online web map where people could share with us their ideas for project ideas uh, around the city. Next slide. We engaged over 1,300 people online and in person throughout the life of this plan. Uh, some of our well attended events were our walking and biking tours and our engagement at ECCL summer camp uh, one day. Next slide. We had 595 suggestions on our interactive web map and 2,000 interactions. And this is a screenshot of our project website that's still active today. Next slide. We really want to make sure that the word got out, and so we spent uh, significant resources and time and energy on that. We sent 19,000 postcards to every resident and business address in the city. The city installed 20 sidewalk decals, which you can see here on the right, that circle there. In fact. 
I was at public market for dinner tonight and saw one is still out there, so these things have got a long longevity. We had social media advertisements that went out ahead of each workshop. We distributed hundreds of listening session flyers, in fact, going door to door to make sure that those were up in break rooms, that managers were distributing those to staff, so that we would recruit for that. Um, as I mentioned before, hearing from low-income workers and hard-to-reach populations was a core focus for us, and so we wanted to make sure that the word got out. We also wanted to compensate people for their time in terms of being members of those working sessions, listening sessions, and so we were able to give stipends for people that attended and gave us their time and input. Next slide. So now I'm going to walk through the final plan. Next slide. The plan is broken up into uh, a couple different uh, categories. We have an executive summary. We go into the plan vision and goals, which really guides uh, understanding of where we're trying to achieve with this plan. We analyze biking, walking, and rolling in Emeryville today. Then we come up with our suggestions for projects, programs, and policies that the city could consider based off of available funding and staff resources. Implementation and funding is a guide to implementing those ideas and then appendices to back up the recommendations. I'd also mention that the appendices have quite a bit of information about the public engagement process. Next slide. So chapter one is your executive summary, next. It includes an introduction, a purpose of the active transportation plan, kind of a quick guide of what's in the plan to orient users to the, the overall document. We highlight major projects and studies and give information about bikeway mileage. Next. So this is something that's uh, new that I'll mention. This is in the executive summary. We have the major projects and studies slide here. Uh, the major projects are color coded and all the different study locations are here in brown. Next. So chapter two, if you go to the next slide. This is a vision statement that was crafted with members of the public along with the, the BPAC, quite a bit of uh, back and forth with them as well as members of council. The city of Emeryville is a community where active, sustainable transportation is the easy choice. It is safe, comfortable, equitable, and accessible to all. The continuous connected network of world-class facilities eliminates the necessity of driving a car and makes active transportation accessible to people of all identities, race, ethnicity, age, gender, socioeconomic status, ability, or orientation. The city promotes active travel through infrastructure, education, and encouragement programs. The city inspires other communities with its visionary and forward-thinking commitment to active transportation. Next. To realize that aspiration, that vision, there are several goals. The first goal is that through this plan, we hope that the active transportation network is comfortable, that it's connected, that people who are out there experiencing it experience a joyful sensation, that it's equitable, that it's sustainable, and finally, that the plan is implementable. Next. So now I'm going to walk through chapter three, which is our existing conditions analysis. We looked at your current demographics, where people are living in terms of densities. We looked and mapped major destinations that people might reach, walking, biking, and rolling, such as employment centers and retail hubs. We mapped your transit network. We looked at equity in terms of where low-income workers uh, who are accessing jobs in the city may live in the region, and also median household income. We evaluated your existing bikeway network and looked at walking connectivity and barriers. We also looked at safety in terms of bicycle and pedestrian collisions and the level of traffic stress that people out there experience while biking. Some of the key takeaways, next slide, are that arterial roadways and crossings are stressful, particularly on 40th Street, Powell, and San Pablo Avenue. Walking routes can be improved by removing identified barriers, and the existing bikeway network is not yet comfortable for people of all ages and abilities. Next slide. So to develop these ideas, we developed our policies, programs, and projects chapter, which is chapter four. Next slide. We gathered input from data through the needs assessment from the public, from our BPAC. We then collaborated with staff and different stakeholders, such as emergency responders and Alameda CTC, to come up with feasible and impactful policy programs and project ideas. Next. In terms of policy recommendations, these focus around a commitment to plan implementation, maintenance, safe routes to school, 
a right turn on red policy, how the plan will be evaluated for its success, leading pedestrian intervals, and lowering the speed limits in town. Next. Programmatic recommendations revolved around equity, education, encouragement, evaluation, and wayfinding. And I'll note that the, uh, the city will receive or has received sign templates and placement plans for wayfinding to be implemented as different projects uh, are funded. Next slide. Project recommendations take a bulk of this chapter. It's really about identifying this all ages and abilities network, which is shown here on this map in blue. We identified safe routes to walking, biking, and rolling destinations to make sure that people could use this network to get to parks and trails, to get to shopping, transit, and schools. We want to identify a comfortable and connected pedestrian network as well, and looked at intersection upgrades at arterial crossings, which were identified as really important barriers to address in the plan. Next slide. So we have a couple different tools that the city can implement this plan with in terms of pedestrian tools, creating new sidewalks or improving existing sidewalks, creating shared use paths. At intersection locations and crossings, new or upgraded crossings and intersection upgrades along with additional signage. And in terms of bikeway tools, you can create shared use paths, which are by Caltrans classification called class ones. These are completely off street where people uh, enjoy a trail-like experience, separated bikeways, which are called class fours. This has a physical separation between people bicycling and mo motor vehicle traffic. And then other bikeway types, such as class twos, which are your standard bike lanes, or class three bike routes and bike boulevards. Next. Map 22 in the plan identifies the proposed recommendations for the uh, pedestrian network. It identifies in blue the new sidewalk locations or pedestrian paths in salmon color, improved existing sidewalks, uh, dashed green are the class one shared use path recommendations, and then the dashed red are the study corridors, which I'd uh, recommend or I clarify are both for people walking and bicycling. Next slide. Proposed spot improvements are those crossing locations. We have over 65 different improvements uh, to help people get across the street. In yellow are the intersection upgrades. Uh, these are the higher dollar uh, locations. Uh, red are new or upgraded crossings. Uh, blue would be signage. And in the plan, there are also tables with all these identified, uh, as well as for more information about the location and what's being recommended. Next slide. The bikeway network, shown here on map 24, has uh, existing bikeways in solid colors, and then your recommendations starting with uh, dash green for class one shared use paths, uh, dashed light blue for bicycle lanes, dark navy for buffer bicycle lanes, yellow for bike routes, uh, orange for bicycle boulevards, Let's see, red for class four separated bikeways, and then the dotted are studies as well. And there's also trail rehab that we identified along the Bay Trail. Next slide. All this together results in uh, 17 and a half miles of proposed bikeway. I think some things to point out here that differentiate this active transportation plan uh, versus your current one are if you look at bike routes, you have 1.5 miles today. You can see we're only recommending 0.1 miles just to fill in a small connector there. And in terms of bike boulevards, you have 2.5 miles, 2.1 are recommended. Probably the largest uh, difference today is that you only have 0.9 miles of your class four separated bikeways. I think a big central focus of this plan was to identify where we could get people out of vehicle traffic, where they're sharing the road and creating these separated bike facilities. So this plan recommends over five and a half miles of new separated bikeway facilities. Next slide. There are some larger all-encompassing projects, these multimodal projects. Four of them were identified, and there's a suite of different projects that kind of pull together on this. The first is the San Pablo Avenue corridor, which is being led by Alameda CTC. The 49th Street, uh, sorry, the 40th Street, I'm not sure, 40th Street multimodal project. Uh, there's also a, con a companion to this, the 40th Street multimodal project phase two, which is the ba uh, Bay Trail gap closure which is in this light orange. 
and then the Emeryville Loop in blue. Now, the plan has many more details, including a couple conceptual designs for these multimodal projects. Next slide. So this is an example for the San Pablo Avenue corridor showing uh, all the individual bikeway and uh, pedestrian projects that go into this corridor along with uh, the vision from Alameda CTC. Next slide. The 40th Street multimodal project, which uh, is a project that predated this planning effort, and so we wanted to be consistent with the work that's ongoing in terms of this design. Next. The 40th Street multimodal project phase two, which is a Bay Trail gap closure linking the loop project down to 40th Street. Um, we also developed as part of this plan some conceptual designs to help uh, speed up implementation and be used for grant funding applications. Next slide. Along with the Emeryville Loop, which is an idea that um, was, I think, came out of this planning effort through collaboration with the BPAC and with council and with uh, city staff. So this also has conceptual designs for reorienting kind of the downtown loop uh, in Emeryville. Next slide. Our multimodal studies include Christie Avenue, the Hollis Street Transit Corridor Study, which would look at what improvements could be made to improve transit flow, also could be used to look at different bike or pedestrian improvements in the corridor. Powell Street, pretty much the whole length of Powell requires additional study. We weren't comfortable at this stage with all the different trade-offs that would be involved to make a recommendation, so additional study would be needed for those. Uh, Stanford Avenue study, Bay Trail widening study, and Park Avenue multimodal studies along with Mandela Parkway. All right, chapter five, next slide. We developed a custom graphic to help explain how projects move from this master plan to construction and also where the public can participate along the way. Uh, I can tell you that other ju jurisdictions are already copying this. They've seen what's going on here. They like this graphic to explain again uh, how it moves from city council working through budgeting with city staff, developing preliminary plans and doing additional engineering studies, developing concept designs and detailed designs all the way through construction. And so this master plan is really even before stage one here. There's also identification of where the public is gonna be involved in those first three steps and where the public can get information as, this, as each project moves forward. Next slide. The plan identifies funding sources, including the city's own capital improvement program, using conditions of approval with private development, and also external grant sources. Next. The appendices, if you go to the next slide please, include a copy of the complete streets policy, the city's own complete streets policy, Appendix A. Appendix B is the public engagement documentation, and that really includes um, outreach engagement strategies, our outreach phases, noticing materials, our public presentations at all of our events. And then Appendix C are the project recommendations tables. So again, if anybody uh, would like to get more information about each of these projects, that's the place to do that. Next slide. So I'll walk through some of the changes from the first draft plan and the revised draft plan. Next. So from the first draft plan in chapter two, the plan vision and goals, we added some information, the Emeryville Public Arts Master Plan, North Alameda County Core Connections Plan, and the Alameda CTC Countywide Bike Network Plans were added to show how the active transportation plan supports implementation of these other planning efforts. And part of that recommendation came from the Planning Commission. Next slide. Chapter three, the biking, walking, and rolling in Emeryville today. The title for map eight was modified from home locations of low-income workers in Emeryville to where low-income workers live to help explain that the map shows where low-income workers live in the region who commute into Emeryville to work uh, retail jobs, low-income jobs, typically. Table two, the commute mode trends was added to show how people have changed their work commute patterns between 2011 and 2020. And the biking, walking, and rolling safety section was updated to include the most recent five-year data that was available at the time, so updating it to 2017 to 2021. Next. Chapter four, through lots of comments we received, mostly from the BPAC, we reorganized this chapter to make it a little bit more easy to follow and included this key at the top to orient readers how they could follow each recommendation. So we have policies and programmatic recommendations at the start, 
then pedestrian and network and spot improvement projects, bikeway projects, multimodal projects, and then studies. Next. For chapter four, we also uh, included a new prefix number for ease of tracking. Uh, this number is now included with every recommendation, policy, programmatic, or project. Uh, it's also in all of the project tables and maps. Major projects and studies were added to show all the multimodal projects and studies on one map. That's now on page 114. Next. A new major project was added. Um, a description, map, table, recommendations, and conceptual design were added for the 40th Street Multimodal Phase 2. We also added two studies on the Hollis Street Transit Corridor study and the Mandela Ex Parkway Extension and East Bay Bridge Shopping Center Class 4 study. We also added discussion of quick build projects to be included, which is an option that city staff have to expedite the um, implementation of projects by using durable, low-cost materials. Next slide. Uh, chapter four, we added a couple projects. These were based uh, from public input. E32 is a new shared use path recommendation from 53rd to 47th Street on the western property line of ECCL. A shared use path from Spur Alley to 47th Street and also a shared use path from 47th Street to 45th Street through the AC Transit property. All of these are long-term visions and require the redevelopment or easements for property owners to accomplish these recommendations. Next. The implementation uh, chapter, the cost estimates section was modified to better reflect the variability in estimating and planning level costs. And the project delivery process graphic, we uh, modified that to identify where members of the public could be engaged throughout the life of project delivery. Next. Our appendices, we added those project recommendations tables, though those were not originally in the first draft plan. Those have been added. Next slide. And then from the revised draft plan to the plan document, we updated the plan cover for this month, October 2023. On page 20, we also added reference to the Alameda CTC Countywide Bikeways Design Guide as a resource for staff to implement recommendations in the active transportation plan and a hyperlink there. And we also corrected a header on page 60. It was just broken across, across the page. Next slide. The appendices, we also updated the cover on page A18, we changed information to update the uh, placeholder that was there for the, B the last BPAC meeting to note that the BPAC recommended to City Council to adopt the plan. And then we also updated the placeholder for the Transportation Committee meeting uh, to identify and, and show that the Transportation Committee recommended City Council adopt the plan. So those are, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. And I thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, first, I'll call for public comment. Are there any members of the public who wish to give comment on an item 11.1? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back. Is there any questions from members or comments? Member Mora. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned the um, one of the measures was no right turn on red. Was that a, it was mentioned as a evaluated option, but um, I, I didn't see any specific, are there specific locations where you know that this was proposed or discussed? I think I, I'll Whoever take, yeah, I can take that. Sure, it, no specific locations, it's more of a blanket policy for the city to evaluate implementing no right turn on red as projects are developed. Got it. One more question. Um, I, I've kind of noticed uh, on the established part of the Greenway um, the, on 66, 67th Street, uh, vehicles do drive very quickly through there. Um, were there any measures proposed or discussed speed humps uh, or anything else of the sort? I didn't see that in the plan and I've increasingly noticed that it's a problem. And I just want to make a general comment too. I, I don't think our city has fully reckoned with what we've created with the Greenway. It's rather unique. It's very special. Um, personally, when I drive a vehicle through there, um, if I don't come to a full and complete stop, I'm at risk of hitting somebody. Uh, I think a lot of cars understand that. Um, and it's something that I wish we could take a closer look at, um, possibly even having stop signs at these intersections. Uh, I've, I've, 
personally witnessed near miss. Uh, it doesn't show up on the collision count, uh, but I've seen sc screeching brakes of vehicles, and I'm, I'm wondering if this is something that we've considered, and with adopting the plan uh, as is, would it preclude us from considering uh, other safety measures? There are a few recommendations at those locations. They're more signage for, this is what we heard from the members of the public was, as you're on the greenway, not knowing which intersection you're coming up to. So uh, D3, 4, and 5, I think, are generally those locations. But no, the plan does not preclude you from adding on to anything that's here. So if through council or through city staff, identify additional enhancements to what's here, absolutely, they can go and pursue those. Thank you. Here's um, Member Pryforce. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, so uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, the vision plan uh, mentioned something around the, the elimination of uh, the, the, the necessity for a car. And I, you know, many uh, just, you know, statistics uh, shows that, um, that, so this is two things. One is, that um, you know, to to mention the necessity of a car, which I believe is a class, definitely a class-based need, um, can kind of come across as elitist. And then um, from just like good nonprofit sort of mission shared, you know, uh, writing standpoint, it's very hard to say you're only eliminate a need. So for example, if an organization says that it is uh, an anti-gun violence uh, uh, organization, but if it says for its mission, well, we want to eliminate the need for a gun, you know, really? You want to eliminate the need for a gun? You know, so uh, you can say you can eliminate barriers, or in this case, like if I, if I put my nonprofit brain on, um, you could say eliminate, um, the, the eliminate eliminate the the use of uh, of eliminate eliminate the you could you could say eliminate the the need or the use of uh, vehicles or, or cars um, as a privilege, right? And so uh, so then you are kind of attacking more so something that is systemic as opposed to something that may be perceived as uh, sort of a, in, uh, something that is individual. Um, uh, and, and this is important like for me because if I have conversations with people, I don't want them to come to me and say, well, you know, well, do you believe this in this too? And I say, well, yeah, the word is kind of funky. So, um, so just something to, to consider. Uh, when it comes to how you get input from low income communities, can you give some clarification on that? Because I am a BMR resident, so I would be considered a low income uh, community, uh, but I haven't received anything in the mail or anything related to um, these, um, to the decals or the, uh, the, the flyers. And you know how you know that everyone got something is because most of it's in the trash. And so in the trash, you know, the bucket is usually there. And so you can see pretty much what everybody got, right? Especially during election season. Um, and so uh, can you give me more clarification around that? Um, yeah, and then I have another question. Uh, but yeah, I, I can start off with that. Sure, uh, everybody in the city with the beginning of the project received a postcard. Everybody with a business address or a residential address received a postcard. So we felt like that was a good first attempt to make sure that Folks knew about this plan. That was an invitation to be part of the study. Um, we had 20 different sidewalk decals placed, and I think that the location of those is in the appendix, and if not, I can get that information for you. So those were in really all across the city in terms of high demand areas. Um, the biggest one, I think, was hearing from people who work shift work, who come in, maybe don't live in Emeryville, but work in hotels and at retail locations. And so that was really going door to door and talking with managers and also with uh, labor union staff about getting the word out to be part of those uh, listening sessions. So that was our kind of our big effort there to hear from people who are maybe coming in. We heard from people who have uh, shift work, who work uh, janitorial services, work at Ikea, who are coming in, and also owners of um, 
and people who work at um, Subway, uh, their barriers to getting in, what they're doing, why they're, bu why they're driving, although they would wish to be able to bike if they could, and kind of identifying routes that they would take. So those are kind of the key areas that we targeted in terms of hearing from those folks that we typically don't hear from in, in these active transportation plans. So in terms of low-income residents, though, um, was there a particular strategy or good faith effort to reach out to them outside of what everyone else got? Yeah. Additionally, we, we didn't uh, make, uh, we utilized all of the city's, um, sorry, I'm trying to use my words, <laughs> all of the city's um, communication tools. So if we have email lists for people who are, uh, for a low income housing or email list for HOEs or email list for you name it. We utilized all of those lists for small businesses, everything. So I would say that low income communities were included in that through those notification lists that we already have. Does okay. that help answer that question? Yeah, no, it does. And it's, and it's not a reflection of you guys. I think it's something that I've mentioned to the city manager several times about our communication um, I wouldn't necessarily say um, strategy, it's more like infrastructure, um, that our communication infrastructure in the city really lacks in terms of our ability to collect feedback, get it back from others. And um, and so, I mean, I'm sure other cities go through the same issue, uh, but with a city of our size, there's very few reasons why we can't test and experiment on ways to be able to collect that kind of feedback or be able to identify those who are, for example, BMR residents to be able to uh, reach out to them. Because once again, when something happens and then they come to me and they talk to me about it and I go, I don't know, I, you, well, you got, I didn't get either, you know? So, um, so how we do that is something um, that I'll probably bring up for a future agenda item uh, in the future. Uh, the, the last question is around the IP addresses. Um, of the online surveys in terms of how do we prevent it so that it's not just a bunch of people outside of Emeryville who are who sort of chiming in uh, who may have agendas of their own as opposed to them actually being Emeryville residents and workers and students. Good question. Uh, we did ask for people to identify kind of what is their relationship with Emeryville. Do you live and work here? Do you uh, just commute here? So that, that information was there. I think we also asked for zip code information. Um, but we did not lock down to limit like one IP address per response because we didn't want, like if people of the same household were sharing a computer, we didn't want to like limit it to one survey response per household. So there's always the opportunity for people to, you know, game the system and vote multiple times if that was their intention. Looking at the results, um, we didn't see kind of widespread like vote counting or kind of swaying it in one direction or the other. Um, but that's something, again, we could we could look at further. Yeah, uh, one thing that we can do is maybe the voter rolls. They um, have actual email addresses. And so if we have them use their email addresses, maybe we can uh, track them that way. I mean, I mean, that's just one put to pop up in my head. But there's uh, other ways to, because, you know, I mean, can you imagine a New, a New York City had a survey and then a whole bunch of folks from Texas were like, yeah, we would love to chime in on what we want to see happen in New York City. And so, you know, um, it, so it just prevents um, there from being um, it, those with nefarious uh, uh, intentions. And uh, that's, and yeah, that, I think that's, that's about it. But um, how outreach is, is really important and making sure that um, people feel that that these plans, these huge, you know, overarching plans, uh, are inclusive, and they see themselves represented in in, in 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 a lot of this. And so, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. And I, I will mention that a lot of our outreach was done early stages of this. This project has kind of gone on for a lot longer than I think originally scoped, and start you kind of start to lose some of that energy that starts off there. And so, I think that's another good lesson learned for us uh, moving forward. Vice Mayor Welch. Oh, I, I know this is, it's a topic of concern. I just wanted to note and to share that as a BMR tenant and black woman, single mother, I received the invitation in the mail and also digital communications around the active transportation plan, housing element, different surveys. So they are reaching people. I just wanted to know, I know it's a element of concern, but 
I know it just might be siphoned in different groups. Some people don't communicate with absolutely everyone, but I just wanted to note that even in my very, very early on in my residency here, I was receiving those communications. Just to follow up with that, one of the things that did make the plan take longer is expanding our scope for outreach to make sure that we did include youth who will be people who live with the results of this the longest, right? And to make sure that we really did do that outreach for low income workers who may or may not live in Emeryville, you know? So we did. Um, it, the plan did take longer in part because we really wanted to invest in that outreach to make sure that we were getting as many people as possible. There is always room for improvement. It is always a learning process. Um, I do think we did incredibly well with the learning curve we had and the resources and expanding our scope and coming back and making sure that we we're allocating our resources appropriately for that. Um, so I feel confident that we did a very good job and I feel confident that we'll learn from this and also do better in the future. Thank you. Before you do that, Madam Clerk, I just for the legal purposes, I need to open and close a public hearing actually. So um, I'm going to open a public hearing at 857. I'm going to invite again any member of the public who wishes to comment in a public hearing to come and give comment at public hearing. And seeing none at 857, Madam Clerk, I close the public hearing. Okay, Councilmember Mora. Um, I, I just wanted to say I you know, not to distract from the, the overall plan, which was a enormous effort that I appreciate tremendously. It was uh, very nice to see that during my time on the planning commission. Uh, so I'd like to thank staff for that. Uh, and I'm prepared to make a motion to approve the resolutions before us if there's no other comments. Um, before we do that, I'll just ask the city attorney, um, these aren't ordinances, so they can just be voted on individually as resolutions without title reading, correct? That is correct. These are not city ordinances. These are resolutions of the city council. Thank you. Um, so before you, you can make the motion, but before you do that, I just would like to uh, thank the consultant and your team. I'd like to thank staff from the planning and public works uh, departments for their work in helping assemble this. Uh, I agree. We had a lot of engagement, um, over 800 responses, 2,000 activations around this. Um, and yes, this is an item that mayors and other cities have asked me to see the final product of. I have a couple people waiting for us to approve it, to share it with them. So it's, uh, it's extremely inclusive in terms of the information it gathers and the breadth of um, data that it incorporates into the plan. And so I'm really optimistic and hopeful that um, this will be a great plan going forward. I have comments for Councilmember Moore offline about his Greenway crossings. I have a lot of history to share with you about my efforts to do the things you asked about and what former, I mean, maybe I'll just tell you that the former public works director uh, opposed speed bumps and stop signs. And I asked for both of those things and I was given a lot of reasons why those are not um, preferred. And we were given the little speed cushions instead uh, as a mitigation, but I'm happy to talk to you more offline about what reasons were given at the time at least. Understood. Okay, so at that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the active transfer transportation plan and the uh, amending the general plan accordingly uh, as described in, in the agenda item. So both you're moving both sub items. That's right. Okay. And I'm going to second that motion. Uh, there's a motion by Mora and a second by Bowders to approve the resolutions in 11.1.1 and 11.1.2. Please call the roll. Council member Carr. Aye. Council member Mora. Aye. Council member Pryforce. Aye. Vice Mayor Welch. Aye. And Mayor Bowders. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to our remaining action item, which is consideration of travel authorization for myself um, to DC. Is there staff going to present anything on this? We don't really have anything to present beyond what was in the report. Okay, are there any questions on the report? Okay, I'll take public comment. Now is the time for public comment. A member of the public wishing to comment on item 12.1 has two minutes to do so. Okay, public comment is closed. Is there any discussion? Questions? Where are you going? DC. But what in, Pur the, in the, And this, the purpose of the trip is to represent the city um, with the Federal Rail Administration and with the Federal Department of Transportation related to our quiet zone application, um, as well as uh, our grant submission for reconnecting communities um, to have a conversation about funding to close the funding gap on the 40th Street project was offered to me as an opportunity by 
the Alameda County Transportation Commission's lobbyists to bring funding back for our city. Sounds cool. I move approval. I'll second. Okay, thank you. There's a motion by Welch and a second by Mora to approve. Please call the roll. Councilmember Carr? Aye. Councilmember Mora? Aye. Councilmember Pryforce? Aye. Vice Mayor Welch? Aye. And Mayor Batters? Aye. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, we'll turn to department head reports. Are there any this evening? There are none this evening, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, we'll go to future agenda item requests. Member Carr, do you have any? No. Member Welch? Not this time, thank Member you. Mora? Uh, yeah, I... Yes, I, I do appreciate the explanation on the Greenway crossings. Um, just given the timeliness of it, I, I would be interested in having a future agenda item, which I'm, which I'm also open to referring to Transportation Committee, uh, to look at stop signs at those Greenway crossings, 65th, 66th, and 67th, um, and also other uh, speed mitigation measures like speed humps. Um, because I, I, I think the use of the, things have changed, the use of the greenway uh, and the amount of traffic it gets, uh, both bike, pedestrian and vehicle, I think justifies revisiting this topic. Um, I would be happy to support this uh, with it coming to the Transportation Committee because we do have an agenda item related to this. So we would be happy to do a, rep a report. It could be first a paper report to the council so that the council has the information and if the committee wants to recommend a more detailed presentation after it, because we do have a new public works director, we can do that as well. So is that okay with you? Yes. I support, 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 mm -hmm. support, yes. Okay, so that's been, you have a question? I just wanna make sure I heard you right. So the referral was to the transportation committee yes. first. Okay. To, and so um, what I'd like to ask is uh, we have, uh, well actually, we. No, we don't have that agenda item anymore. So if we could just have a future agenda item at Transportation Committee um, to discuss greenway crossing safety, speed mitigation, that would be appreciated. Could you specify stop signs for consideration? Yeah, stop signs, yep. Yeah, we can, we, I guarantee you, if we had a committee meeting last night that went almost three hours, we definitely go into the weeds on the topics. So we will make sure we have a detailed discussion about the mitigations, including stop signs. Okay, Member Pryforce, do you have any items? Uh, yeah, uh, so this one's a kind of a toss-up uh, between myself and Madam Clerk. Um, so um, is it necessary for me to place on the future agenda item, or is that currently being worked out around the holiday celebration uh, decorations, um, and whether or not to um, uh, be able to recognize like Kwanzaa or Lunar New Year and those many holidays that I brought up uh, in the past uh, where we didn't have uh, decorations for those. Is that something that is already being worked on or should I add that to the future agenda item? I, I actually can help with that. If you'd okay. like to make a referral, that could go to community services because okay. it would be their department and we could all agree to put that on your committee agenda. Got it. Okay, is that cool. okay with you? Yeah, thank you. So okay. all in favor of having community services committee discuss holiday decoration appropriateness? Okay. So that has majority support. So please... I know Rebecca left, but please put that on their committee agenda timely so that it's not after the fact, please. Do you have any other requests? Uh, yeah, well, the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. Okay, I have, right. can I do mine first? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, go okay, I have mm -hmm. two. I have two items. Um, my first item is, we heard a public speaker earlier this evening. I'd like to request, um, this would be follow-up in some ways to an item that we did in 2018 when we did our smoking pollution control ordinance. Um, there's a, an increase in youth um, addiction to tobacco products and the harmful nature it has in the lives of young people. Um, Emeryville has been a great leader in um, environmental standards and improving public health. Um, you know, the police department has a role in helping ensure that local retailers are compliant with state law as it pertains to what products can be sold, sold and marketed in the way in which those are done. Um, Alameda County, we're one of only three cities in this county that does not have a um, tobacco retail license requirement and that license can contain that requirement can contain it's it's a few hundred dollars for a retailer a year so it's not like it's a an, an exorbitant fee or anything but it can contain provisions that help us um, advance policies that further reduce the targeting of young people for tobacco companies and um, I'd like to ask that we bring two things back. One is I'd like to have a study session about that and invite the American Cancer Society and the Alameda County Department of Public Health to come and be uh, work with staff and present on this. We're not inventing an ordinance that doesn't exist. This is used elsewhere in Alameda County. 
Um, and with it, our smoking pollution control ordinance, the one ding we got from Alameda County is that we, our current ordinance does all these great things to prohibit smoking and housing and enforcement of that in a way that's um, you know, fair to people and is not criminal in nature. But we left open the opportunity for independent standalone smoke rooms and um, smoke rooms actually subject their employees to secondhand smoke and people who can get jobs in smoke rooms are typically um, lower income people people returning from incarceration and i feel that's um it, it is not appropriate for us to leave open that loophole that the county has told us in the health world repeatedly is is not a best practice so i'd like to ask for a study session to come back and discuss um, tobacco retail license to conform with the rest of our county and also to revisit that one provision of the pollution control ordinance. Is there support for that request? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So if we could just agenda that and um, work with our partners. And then my other request, um, unfortunately, I would have put this together with 12.1 this evening um, to make it timely. And I don't mean to have another agenda item, but the agenda had been published already and I couldn't add it to this agenda or we'd had our last meeting. Um, I've been invited to speak um, at a, at, on a national panel with the National Fail Ad, Federal Rail Administrator and the National Director of Amtrak um, related to rail policy. Alameda County is fourth in the nation for pedestrians who are killed at rail crossings. And um, the, the opportunity is to sit at a national roundtable and discuss how um, our local work interfacing with Amtrak and the Union Pacific, um, how that's worked because there is a huge federal investment in um, in rail safety infrastructure and the rail safety enhancement program, the RCEP program. Um, and a lot of cities are interested in this, but a lot of them have questions about what it's like to work with railroads. And so I've been asked to speak on that panel. And if folks would agree, I would like to just get the um, the travel to and from the, the, I don't have to pay any registration or anything. It's just to travel to and from if people are okay with that for a future agenda request. Okay, thank you. And that, I think we'll go back to member Pry Force. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, given um, all the world events uh, that um, uh, that are occurring, uh, that uh, the fragility of democracy is um, is is something that um, a lot of people are are questioning. News news pundits, yeah, um, uh, electeds uh, like ourselves, uh, that the uh, pledge of allegiance, especially. Um, I've gotten some feedback about the Pledge of Allegiance um, and the removal of um, the, um, uh, 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 the the God mention of for the Pledge of Allegiance uh, as a barrier to reintroducing the Pledge of Allegiance so that it becomes optional is um, um, is is. It's gotten uh, a lot of p uh, positive feedback, and so I would like to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and once again, I will uh, leave space for those who want to say uh, under God, um, and so in hopes that um, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance can be added as a future urgent item uh, to discuss whether or not to add the, f uh, the Pledge of Allegiance back to uh, City Hall uh, proceedings. So. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Are there any other members who wish to give a uh, request of future agenda item who have not done so? Madam Clerk, the time is 9.10. We're adjourned.